so in the, the last section of revisioning psychology where um, Hillman is exploring the Renaissance and what the Renaissance means for soul, psyche, depth psychology, etc. He said, um, he's talking about Neoplatonism, and he says, Neoplatonism gives place to the imagination within man and his psychology. This is still in the 19, mid 70s when people were still using the word man more uh, unthinkingly. Uh, but the Renaissance in general recognized that the imagination must have a place, a realm for envisioning. And he said, imagination's place might be the night sky of Renaissance astronomers or astrologers, or the geographical continents of its explorers. It might also be the gigantic mythological construction of Dante's worlds. It could be the complex vessels and stoves of alchemist laboratories, the memory theater of Giulio Camillo, or the imaginal past of Greek and Roman antiquity. And this is the key point. Imagination must have space for differentiated unfolding. This immeasurable depth of soul must have a container. If we today would restore imagination to its full significance, we too need some sort of enormous room that can act as its realistic vessel. Um, the archetypal uh, astrological vision is, is one, such, um, one such vessel that allows for the, the precise differentiation of, of, uh, of the archetypal complexes, the combinations, how they are um, uh, expressed in a particular individual in, their per uh, in specific dynamics that are unique to that person and also the unfolding uh, in world transits and in personal transits, etc. And, and Hillman was very, I mean, you could see in that Saturn Senex essay how much he was tuned into the tradition. And uh, astrology was a, was a uh, significant part of his, his, uh, his vision and the shaping of his uh, psychological consciousness. Now, um, I want to spend just a, f a few minutes looking at his birth chart because it's so uh, powerfully reflective of his major archetypal dynamics of his qualities as a person, uh, uh, in his thinking, etc. Um, and I'm not expecting you to know ast astrology. I mean, I know a number of you know it very well and, and others won't. Um, but we're basically going to be looking at the geometrical alignments or aspects between the uh, different planets and the sun and moon. That's the major focus here. There you can see the sun and moon, obviously. He's born with a tight conjunction, born right at the new moon in Aries. Then he's born with uh, Mercury, that's Mercury there, and Uranus in a conjunction at the midheaven. Then he's born also with Pluto rising. So Pluto's right at the ascendant, quite... Uh, like his two big angular planets are the, the ones that are ones at the rising, the others at the midheaven are uh, these outer planets, this Promethean Uranus at the top and Pluto rising. Then he's, uh, and then really the, the great mystery of his chart unfolds, particularly with this very challenging, powerful T square. T square is where you have an opposition in this case, Jupiter and Mars, opposite Neptune. And then both of them are square to Saturn. Boy, this is a huge thing. Saturn is also trine. That's a harmonious alignment, 120 degrees to the Mercury and Uranus. And ne Neptune, another great trine is this one, Neptune to both the Sun and the Moon. All right, so I'll unpack a lot of these things and then also make reference to Venus there. Um, uh, 
to have that Mercury-Uranus conjunction right at the midheaven, um, the, the midheaven has so much to do with your, you know, kind of what, what you bring into the public eye, uh, the world, uh, and um, your your kind of calling, your aspiration, the 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 um, very visible public dimension of one's um, being, and Uranus has so much to do. It's that it's that Promethean uh, creative innovator, trickster, uh, it's brilliant, it has this potential for genius, and he's got that right at the mid heaven it's so dominant, and it's right on Mercury, so uh, that quality of his, his, in which his, both his thinking and his uh, writing, his, and his speaking, it's just so, so creative, it's so in the moment, and there's lots of uh, play with words. There's neologisms. There's tri he's a it's a trick. He's a trickster with language, um, uh, a trickster with ideas. You know, we're we're he's constantly making these reversals of we, we're we're looking for the uh, the the fantasy and the idea, and we're looking for the idea in the fantasy, and and he, he's doing the he's doing these reversals uh, all the time, or he makes. Pl um, plays with words like uh, uh, throwing pearls before swine, um, Fritz pearls, uh, P, uh, before that kind of uh, little comment that he just tosses off. That's that's very typical. Mercury is mind and speech, logos, the communic the the messenger of the gods, getting this constant like electric stimulation from the pr Promethean. Uh, rebel uh, creative impulse of, of Uranus. Uh, he told me that uh, like the mind is always going for him so much that he has a hard time sleeping at night. Uh, that's partly the, the insomnia tendencies within Saturn, Neptune, uh, the Saturn square Neptune, um, which we'll look at. But the, he, it's like he, I'm sure appreciated the in, incessant intellectual creativity that shapes his day-to-day -day consciousness, but he said he wished that he could turn it off at night so he could just, you know, get some sleep. And that, that is, there's a lot of kind of nervous energy that goes with the Mercury Uranus. And, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a brilliant um, aspect. Uh, potentially, and new ideas coming ceaselessly throughout his life, and, and new horizons opening up, but particularly through the mind. Um, now, that Sun Moon conjunction, um, he spoke about you know being at the prow of the ship and and kind of unaware of all the uh, things that he's uh, crashing through because he's just so focused on the on his own movement. Uh, the the innovator, the pioneer, the creating new ideas and 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 so forth. Very to have both the sun and moon there suggests that Aries-like quality that he describes. But I want to point out more. The solar and the lunar have so much to do with the two modes of consciousness that, uh, in a sense, rule all 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 the cosmos. I mean this the this. The ruler, the sun, as the ruler of the day sky, the moon as the ruler of the night, uh, and the night sky, and um, the the moon has a special relationship to the anima, um, to that which the solar consciousness is unconscious of. To to uh, and so much of Hillman's work is, in some sense, shining a light and being the solar hero on behalf of anima, on behalf of psyche, on behalf of the soul. He's just, that's his, that's, he shines through anima and he shines his light on anima, on psyche. Uh, he's a solar hero on behalf of, 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 of soul. That's the sun and moon. Um, but interestingly, he would often describe as he has that tendency to be deflating and self-deflating, he'd say, my sun and moon are so close together that the sun is burning up the moon. Uh, uh, and what he meant by that, uh, I always wondered actually what, what he meant by it, except for a general, you know, sense he had that things were, that his consciousness was a, a, a 
a problem to deal with. Uh, and I got a, quite a glimpse into it one day. Um, by the way, that sun and moon are tight. It's a quincunx there, that moon to Saturn. I think that has a lot to do with his distance, his sense of distance from in relationships, in family, with his children, uh, earlier uh, married, and, and leaving his homeland, uh, of America, New Jersey, et cetera. Those, there's a lot of um, Saturn moon things there. That's a, but uh, I want to focus here on the sun moon because there was one other t time that I heard him use that phrase. Uh, I it was when he was describing when he was sitting in therapy with Jung himself in the, uh, his, the early period when he was in Zurich in the 1950s. And he said, uh, you know, he's describing just how powerful a person Jung was, you know, large, powerful a mind. Uh, uh, he wasn't like the kind of going with the flow uh, uh, therapist. He was an intervener. He was very much a, a, a agent provocateur. He, he uh, uh, and he was, I think, overpowering for um, Hillman in his own. And as he described it, he said, "I couldn't stay with Jung in in, uh, in analysis because I felt I would get burned up by his son." It's like he was, at that point, he was identified, uh, Hillman was identified with being, you know, the moon on the receptive end. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the child part of him, the more vulnerable part of him, uh, uh, being overpowered by this solar dynamic radiant um, power uh, that centered personality that Jung uh, represented. And what's especially especially striking is if we look at the transits for uh, 1953 when he first came to uh, uh, Zurich and Jung. Um, look at the, uh, where the, um, yeah, just do, you can just go like, I don't know, yeah, 1953, uh, you did 533. Okay, uh, look at where that Saturn-Neptune conjunction is in, the, in 53 when he, first, when he gets to Zurich. It's exactly opposite the Sun-Moon. So, and particularly, well, that, so he, he's born with the Saturn square Neptune. That has a lot to do with the, uh, his psychological uh, concerns with pathology and the suffering soul. But he was so feeling his own suffering soul then, his neurosis, his... Uh, um, that, that feeling of being a, uh, a neurotic in need of psychotherapy. And he goes into therapy with uh, Master Jung, and I mean, Saturn opposite the sun moon. That's where he's just, he's feeling this is, I'm going to get burnt up by the sun. This, it's a problem. The, it's this, at the same time, though, he's getting this download of Jungian psychology and uh, for the rest of his life he's nourished by Jungian psychology which is a very uh, Neptune sun phenomenon. Uh, Jung is a Neptune sun person. He's born with Neptune square sun. Jung's whole psychology is the uh, shine, uh, being a um, is working out the relationship between the individual solar self and the Neptunian archetypal dimension. I mean, that's, that's all of Jung and, and all of Jung's, Jung is the solar hero of myth, mysticism, all those Neptunian things that Neptune represents. So he, he was getting that uh, at the same time he was feeling it as very problematic. Let's go back to the uh, chart by itself. I, I know a by wheel of w transits must, for those of you who are not astrologically inclined, must be like looking at a, um, uh, you know, a multiple x-ray, you know, in a, uh, and you haven't been trained in medical school. But anyway, getting back to the slightly simpler looking chart, um, look at how Pluto's rising, the underworld, the I mean, what, what's his uh, book, The Dream and the Underworld, all the focus on, on the underworld, on the, on the, sh 
shadow plutonic uh, dimension that isn't adequately uh, uh, recognized in the um, uh, humanistic psychology or by the uh, by Christian theology and so forth. He he is a celebrator of that that underworld that that descent into the into the depths where uh, Hades and the uh, re brings the soul through its its paces through its transformation. Um, but a huge thing is this. Uh, First of all, there's a Mars-Jupiter conjunction. You see with Mars, Ju Mars is the, that kind of yang um, uh, warrior energy. It's assertive, it can pick fights, uh, it, uh, it's fast, it's um, forceful energetically. And when you have Jupiter there, it, it supports and expands that impulse. It kind of, this is a kind of soldier of fortune, you know, the soldier comes from Mars, the fortune is Jupiter. There's a kind of expansive uh, adventurer quality. This is definitely the knight errant part of him. The errant B is Uranus, Prometheus, the trickster, but the, the knight is, is Mars, Jupiter. The, you know, think of um, Tolkien with his Mars, Jupiter, the celebrator of the, of the, the return of the king, the warrior, the, the warrior king archetype. Uh, in this case, it's especially, it's like a, a sort of the philosopher part of Jupiter and the warrior come together. And he's a, he is a warrior on behalf of culture, high culture, um, but it's all focused very much in alignment with Neptune. See, an opposition doesn't mean it's negating it. An opposition is like the full moon, sun opposite moon. It's a very dynamic archetypal connection across the... Um, opposition. And so this is the aspect of the expansive um, Neptunian uh, dimension of, of the imaginal world. The, the, he, is, he is a philosopher of the imagination. He is a celebrator, Jupiter, of the imagination, Neptune. Um, and here's, this is, when you, when you uh, compare charts, um, it's quite striking to see when somebody has a special resonance with an, another uh, uh, person, like a, uh, who they view as being a kind of predecessor or somebody they really align themselves with. It's very interesting to do what's called synastry, which is comparing the charts. Uh, Chad, could you just access uh, Ficino's chart? I'm, I think you've got it in your, uh, um, from other courses that we've done here. Oh, because of the uh, old, um, uh, uh, yeah, do this one right there at the top because that's from, that's the one I, I, I work, did it with the biography. Okay, so, okay, now what I want you to, see how he's got that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction too? Ficino's got the Jupiter-Neptune. Now do a, a sinistry, the biwheel. This will just take a quick second. When I showed this to Hillman uh, when he was at, Esalen uh, 30 years ago is pretty remarkable. Look at how that Jupiter-Neptune is right on, like right on the Jupiter-Neptune. I mean, it's, this is, he's born on Ficino's Neptune return. I mean, this is what's called the Neptune, it, that only happens every 172 years. Uh, is that right? Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's um, quite remarkable to have. And this is Ficino's part, that's the Ficino's celebration of the imagination and a soul and making soul central in, in the Renaissance Neoplatonic. Uh, there's a great deal of expansive idealism uh, with Jupiter Neptune. And anyway, that, uh, quite striking that Hillman and Ficino are so lined up because Hillman, Ficino was for Hillman a personal uh, kind of uh, model. All right, let's go back to Hillman on his own. Um, a, a huge, we could spend really the rest of the uh, hour on this Saturn square Neptune, Saturn square Jupiter, very 
very tight. This is the this is the fundamental challenge. When you have a T square, that's where usually like so much of the action of the chart is, where you really have to work things out, where consciousness has to deepen and expand and be transformed, or else it'll really be caught in the grip of, of very challenging complexes. Um, let me let me break it down uh, one part at a time so it's easier to grasp by first doing Saturn. I've done the Jupiter-Neptune where you get that sense of the, like Jung was born with Jupiter opposite Neptune or, or uh, Joseph Campbell with his Jupiter uh, square Neptune right on his sun. So Campbell with this, you know, he was the solar hero, the hero's journey, all the world mythologies can be seen in Campbell's uh, understanding as representing the um, the the great monomyth of the of the hero's journey. Um, that's so much that that kind of embracing mysticism in the case of of Campbell. He doesn't have the Saturn square. See the Saturn squaring Neptune. This brings in a much more Freudian sense of the shadow, the of uh, of the suffering psyche, and a certain potential for the skepticism towards spirit. See, it's very interesting. What Hillman does is he, he takes the two sides of Neptune. Neptune has both a connection with spirit and soul. Spirit is more solar Neptune, sun Neptune. Soul, you know, the, 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 the monotheistic solar, you know, there's only one light in the sky when the sun shines, right? It's the monotheistic, solar monotheistic uh, symbol. While the moon, when it's, visible ruling the night sky, you see many stars. It's the, it's the principle of, of the polytheistic, of the, of the, of the um, anima mundi. You see deep into the space, the deep cosmos um, with the moon. It's, the moon is the symbol of the whole. The sun is the symbol of the, of the brilliant uh, heroic part, the individual, the, the hero in our soul. And um, uh, the, that distinction that Hillman's making so often between uh, spirit and soul are like two different parts of Neptune. And what Hillman does is he gives to soul all the positive qualities of, you know, so he, the Jupiterian, he affirms soul and he sees spirit as having a negative Senex um, potential of, of tyranny, of oppression of, uh, um, you know, it's like the, the, the oppression of the monotheistic uh, tradition that dominates so much of his, of his writing and thinking. This is, this is his uh, taking spirit, that side of Neptune, and, and seeing it through a Senex lens as being oppressive. Um, now, the archetypal vision is very multivalent and astrology particularly carries that. And I'll just show you like three ways in which Saturn square Neptune can be understood in Hillman's uh, chart in life. One is to see it as Neptune represents the, uh, the realm of the imagination, the imaginal uh, realm, the realm of, of myth, of the archetypal. Saturn represents the literal factual world, the nominalist. Remember where he says the, the common uh, sense, the man of common sense with his fistful of facts is a nominalist. That's, that's Saturn, okay, the, with a fistful of facts. It's also the, the um, Mersenne, the, the black robed um, uh, monotheistic monk with putting forward a, a Cartesian science and a uh, Christian uh, uh, theology that was so that Hillman's so allergic to. That's these are black robe Saturn. Um, if you've seen Bergman's Seventh Seal, that's that's Saturn, the the death on the beach, um, Saturn, and he is constantly making a polarity between the literal, which is Saturn, and the imaginal, which uh, the archetypal, the mythic, which is Neptune, and. Um, to give you a sense for how that is played out in, let's say, in, um, 
here's two other people who have Saturn Neptune, just so you can see it. William Blake has Saturn Neptune. And um, here's Blake. May God keep us from single vision and Newton's sleep. See, that's, he's negating the literal, the mechanistic. Uh, or here's, here's Blake again. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Okay? The closing oneself up, narrow chinks of the cavern, that's Saturn. The doors of perception, if they're open, we see everything as it is, infinite, sacred. That's the Neptune, okay? So that's, this, is, this is Blake carrying it. Um, or here's another one from Blake. Art degraded, imagination denied. Even those, see, imagination and art as Neptune, degraded, denied, Saturn. Saturn is the negator. Art degraded, imagination denied, war governed the nations. Poetry fettered, fetters the human race. Nations are destroyed or flourish in proportion as their poetry, painting, and music are destroyed or flourish. You see how uh, Blake is sharply making the Saturn-Neptune, um, uh, which he's born with in, in, in opposition in this case. Okay, and then here's Oscar Wilde, who's also got it. It is through art, capital A, and through art only that we can realize our perfection. Through art and art only can we shield ourselves from the sordid perils of actual existence. See how Oscar Wilde's making the, here's actual existence, here's sordid perils versus art, okay, versus the imagination, etc. So you can, now Hillman's doing that, and he's constantly making that contrast between the tyrannical constrictions of the modern mind with its literalism, its shallow vision, and then by contrast, the soul-making depths of the imaginative and aesthetic sensibility that you find in the ancients, in, in the Renaissance, in Romanticism. Um, and this is his whole engagement with psychology when he says, uh, you know, like, we need a true psychology starts not in the physiology of the brain, um, in the organization of society, nor the analysis of behavior, but in processes of imagination. That's, that's Hillman's basic psychological move. And then you remember the, the great sentence that he's, he, I quoted to you from his preface when we first started this course. Where there is a connection to soul, there is psychology. Where not what is taking place is better called statistics, physical anthropology, see Saturn as matter, material, uh, cultural journalism, or animal breeding. See how he's, he's just constantly making that contrast. Now, there's another, so that's one whole side of, of the Saturn-Neptune aspect, which is a, a sharp polarity between these two realms. But another um, uh, uh, way in which Saturn-Neptune comes through is the tendency is to take the shadow side of Neptune, which is illusion, which is Maya. Um, and Saturn is the capacity to see through it, to see through the illusion. Um, so you see this very often with, like the, the history of skepticism is a history of the Saturn-Neptune archetypal complex. Like the great skeptics of Modern, of modern philosophy, starting with David Hume with his Saturn square Neptune, but Montaigne had it as well. Uh, you see it with Freud, the fu religion is the future of an illusion, his book, The Future of an Illusion. Um, see religion as Neptune, as a Neptunian illusion, and Saturn is negating it. Um, or you see it with uh, Bertrand Russell or uh, um, Foucault and so forth. These are experts at the skeptical act of seeing through. S uh, Saturn Neptune is very strong at seeing through, seeing through the spin, seeing through the hypocrisy. Uh, think of Oscar Wilde who, who did a lot of that. Um, he's constantly doing that. And uh, think of um, uh, John Stewart in our own time with you, very often the Saturn Neptune, he, he's born with the Saturn square Neptune in, in 19. 
62, uh, 62, 63 had a Saturn square Neptune as well. And um, like John, a lot of the great um, sort of satirical uh, masters who with irony would see through the spin of the contemporary politics, like, like Mark Twain had the Saturn Neptune and um, uh, Jonathan Swift. Two, these are masters of irony, masters of, of, of uh, uh, satire, of seeing through. And John Stewart's got, I mean, every, every night, John Stewart basically, he first shows what a politician or a corporation says, and then he shows what they're doing. Um, it's a constant, here's, here's the spin, here's the propaganda, here's the illusion, and then here's, here's, here's what's really happening. And then he does some little, you know, he just kind of raises his eyebrow a little bit, you know, or he goes, and that moment is how he's carrying the, the dialectic, the polarity between these two principles. Um, and then there's one, uh, one last um, way in which I'll, I'll, I'll mention how this Saturn Neptune comes through. And that is the tendency to um, uh, in, in which there is a, uh, he has so many uh, vivid analyses of disenchantment and depression, loss, abandonment, nostalgia, suicide, nightmares, psychic disintegration, falling apart. See, this is the very, this is, this is the very difficult side of Saturn-Neptune because um, uh, Neptune is sort of like our, our, the state of, of, the, of the imagination and Saturn can darken the imagination. It can darken psyche. It can, it can make it uh, um, weighed down with de depression, despair kind of blue. Uh, he's born with the same Saturn square Neptune that Miles Davis was born with, Saturn square Neptune, who, you know, whose great album was kind of blue, and who, uh, and then that's the name of the documentary on melancholia, melancholy and dis depression that, that Hillman has uh, been part of. And um, uh, the blues is, is a Saturn-Neptune phenomenon. It's a constant, Eric Clapton's got it, B.B. Uh, King. It's a constant uh, dialectic between the ideal and the, and the actual. And that gap is what causes the, the tragic sense of the blues, of the, of the loss, of the, um, where, where the pathos comes in. Um, and then so many of Hillman's uh, polarities uh, that he's constantly making judgments, that's Senex, and he's sensing oppression, that's the Senex Saturn, um, when he is contrasting like the Hebraic and the Hellenic. Like here's the Hebraic, here's the Hellenic. Um, or, he's con or it's the monotheistic and the polytheistic. Or it's the north and the south. The north is Germany, etc., has its stern, didactic, ascetic, Germanic, Protestant, rational spirit, while the South has this lushly aesthetic, poetic, pagan, Mediterranean soul. I mean, he's constantly making these, these, these contrasts um, uh, that are characteristic. All right, I'll just give you one other thing here with uh, the, the Saturn squared Jupiter, which we've all been going through the last uh, year, more an op opposition of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, there's many ways it comes through, uh, but in, in Hillman's life and chart, uh, but I want to, and in his thought, but I just want to quote from him. Uh, he wasn't talking about his Jupiter square Saturn when he was saying this, but I invited him to give a lecture at this uh, big conference I told you about, the return of soul to the cosmos in 1997 here in San Francisco. And he gave a marvelous lecture, and in the middle of it, he, he said the following. And if you think about Jupiter as representing, you know, the 
blessings, providence, the positive, the, the affirmation, that which elevates the good side of things, um, but also the potential for inflation and, and uh, excess. And if you think of Saturn as everything we've been talking about, the, the, the problems of, of, it is the archetype of problem, um, capital P. It's, it's, the, it's the cross we bear in life. It's the, it's the, but yet it's also the structure of our unfolding. It's our solidity. Uh, it's our ground in, the, in tradition. It's, it's everything that you read about in Senex, which, which that essay is a marvelous Jupiter-Saturn essay because he, it's a philosophical, cultural, uh, uh, almost deification of, of the Saturn archetype in, uh, uh, as, it, as it dissects it, it celebrates it. Okay, now listen to these words. Um, he was talking about Neoplatonism in the Renaissance, uh, how th they found an efficacious, beneficial reading of even the most maligned planets, like Saturn, the great malefic, as it was called, uh, and of the most inauspicious constellations. All the gods overflow with benefits. It was the human task, the interpreter's task, to discover these benefits. Otherwise, we miss the blessings and we mistake them for curses. Uh, we, we, we mistake the blessings, Jupiter, we mis uh, and mistake them for curses, the Saturn. Now, um, listen how he describes this. In my own wanderings, I found the benefits of Saturn one day in Rome a few years ago. I was staring at the old Saturn temple, closed to visitors by the authorities. Closed, as they say in Rome, for restoration. The restoration may have been going on for 500 years and may go on for another 500. For one way the church can keep the polytheistic past from impinging on current religion is to keep the old places off limits. So many of the old temples are under construction, in restoration, or architect architecturally dangerous. This is, that's a little aside of Hillman, but you see how he, he, can, he can't get by very long without being able to get in a dig uh, on, uh, on the church. Anyway, this is a quote from Hillman. Anyway, it came to me standing there that the curses Saturn had afflicted upon me, Hillman. And then he describes them coldness and distance from human closeness, obsession with thought, obscure depressive moods that paralyzed action, worry over concrete issues I tried to force into order, clumsy handling of novelty, fr frivolity and electronic gadgetry, clumsy handling of novelty, frivolity and electronic gadgetry, burdens of duty, periods of stiffness and crustiness towards myself and others. All these curses had been taken at face value. I had not grasped their efficacy, how they protected me, kept me on course, true to calling. They permitted me to think and welcome solitude. How they had allowed order to suffer defeat in the name of absence and emptiness. In other words, the curses I attributed to Saturn were blessings. Moreover, that day in Rome, I realized it is we who make Saturn a cursed, baleful planet. By taking the blessings he bestows only in a narrow, hard-shelled, oppressive sense, as leaden burdens, rather than also as weighty gifts. Weighty gifts. Saturn, Jupiter, weighty gifts. We miss one half. We miss the heavenly half of the malady. For it is not the God who curses us. We have cursed the God by misreading his efficacy. Isn't that brilliant? Um, I mean, this is, I mean, all the archetypal astrology that we do in this school is so much in that, um, I mean, every, every hard aspect has its nobility and is in, in a, it often represents the most profound uh, dimension of that person or of that era. Um, uh, and then just to um, end it, uh, he says, we must remember here that efficacious doesn't mean only positive. Saturn's gifts still may feel oppressive and constricting. A gift is not only what it literally appears to be. 
we have to wrap them prettily to disguise that every gift is also potentially toxic. Every gift is also gift, capital G, the German word for poison. In fact, in some cultures, see how he's reversing it now? He's saying the, the gift, Jupiter, may be something problematic. In fact, in some cultures, like the Chinese, a gift can serve as a subliminal curse. And unless quickly repaid with a counter gift to the benefactor, you remain beholden. That is obligated, tied, constricted, all these Saturn words, bound by that gift. That's why the longer you put off writing a thank you note, the more of a burden it becomes. <laughs> a gift with its wrappings off reveals its latent curse. The Neoplatonist reading, this is his final uh, words on this, the Neoplatonist reading of a chart returns all things to the gods. He's always going back to Neptune. To the, Neptune is the archetype of all archetypes. It's the Neptune of the, of the imaginal archetypal dimension of the anima mundi, of the pleroma. Uh, the efficacious, uh, he, he says, the reading of a chart by the Neoplatonist returns all things to the gods, but it does not turn all things naively positive. The efficacious way of reading merely refuses to, vi to divide things simply into negative and positive, fortunate and unfortunate, you know, as they used to call them, evil and good aspects, or the malefics and the benefics. Um, it's very rigid polarity that's part of the astrological tradition that he's, that uh, Neoplatonism and uh, that the archetypal astrology of our time is very, and Dane Rudyard, et cetera, has done so much to, um, to dissolve. He said, to divide things simply into negative and positive, fortunate and unfortunate. And then he ends with this, a square can become a Beethoven, a trine, a Forrest Gump. <laughs> he was not fond of the movie Forrest Gump. Um, uh, that's from a 1997 lecture that he gave here uh, uh, in San Francisco at the Return of Soul to the Cosmos Conference. Uh, it's been published in um, a book. Uh, let's see, I've seen it online actually. Um, you can just go online, uh, just do Hillman and uh, I think the name of the talk was something like um, the other um, the heavenly half of our melody is, hmm, I wish I uh, could remember the title of that, uh, how, he, how I saw it online, but oh, it, yeah, yeah, you, all you'd have to do is Google uh, search something like, um, uh, you know, in my own wanderings, I found the benefits of Saturn one day uh, in Rome a few years ago. I mean, if you just get enough of that in there, it will, it will come up. All right, uh, let me just show you very quickly before we leave this chart, um, the transits he had when he, um, do, do April 69 when the, um, the he's there in London and they have the kind of breakthrough that gives birth to um, archetypal, yeah, just April 15th, 69 would be fine. Okay, look at how, this is that enormous triple conjunction of, that was so powerful in the whole culture of 68 and 69, moon landing, Woodstock, the uh, uh, revolutions throughout the world, uh, student rebellions, et cetera, et cetera. Feminism, ecology, so many things are. So that's this Promethean, Jupiterian uh, quantum leap with great evolutionary thrust from Pluto. That whole thing is like perfectly lined up on his Mercury Uranus. So he's just like blasting out. Uh, at the same time, he's bringing, um, you know, the, the Neptunian dimension going right across his Saturn. And uh, he's writing Saturn Senex, uh, which is all about an archetypal reading of, of the Saturn archetype. So he's bringing these two together. But this is, I'm particularly wanting you to see this. This is the aspect of, of births, quantum leaps. Um, I give about, uh, you know, a, a lot of pages in Cosmos and Psyche to the, this correlation with uh, so many different 
you know, uh, periods of powerful creativity and breakthroughs, creative breakthroughs in human history and cultural history. And it's perfectly, this is, this is his Uranus opposite Uranus. This is what, this is what uh, Newton had when, when he wrote the Principia. It's what um, uh, Galileo had when he turned the telescope to the heavens. It's what Betty Friedan had when she wrote Feminine Mystique. It's what Rosa Parks had when she refused to get up from the bus and, you know, uh, catalyzed the civil rights movement in December of 55. It's what Jung had when, when he um, went into the Red Book period. It's what Freud had when he started, first started doing his own self-analysis, used the word psychoanalysis, began free association, etc. It's, it's that big, it's only Uranus opposite Uranus. It's the Prometheus full moon moment. Okay. Um, I think uh, I think I'll leave it there because um, I want to do a couple other things before we before we leave. But you get a sense for um, the uh, the way in which a birth chart or you know the, the horoscope, the arch and archetypal astrology in general permits a the potential for a um, uh, a nuanced, it holds the space for a nuanced differentiation of uh, archetypal discernment. In fact, I ran across a passage in um, Hillman's work where he was talking about um, the role of differentiation in, uh, in analysis and in the whole individuation process. And I think I think I can, yeah. Individuation requires separations. Separations of complexes from each other. Separations of the individual from the collective. Separation of projection from the object. And separation of the God image from God. See, all those are essential to the individuation process. And he goes, you feel as if you are a stranger because you're doing all this separation in the process of, of uh, differentiating. And he was very in, in touch with that. So I want to um, give just a little bit here. Oh, yeah, thanks. I can't hear you, just a sec. What's that? Uh, it was just a um, comment he made in a guest lecture he gave in a course that I was doing at Pacifica years ago. I just took good notes, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is uh, uh, one last um, part of the dialogue that Hillman conducted between archetypal psychology and Jungian analysis. In a way, it's between him and Jung, between uh, archetypal psychology and the cl classical orthodox tradition of, of Jungian psychology. And he said, um, this is from the 2000 uh, seminar. He said, another difference between classical orthodox Jungianism, as he, you would see it in, say, Edinger, von Franz, uh, uh, is that uh, Jung systematized coming from his scientific medical background. And so you see that in his followers like Esther Harding with her focus on stages, Marie-Louise von Franz with her focus on diagrams, uh, Edinger with his diagrams as well, but also the individuation process, uh, the ego self axis, etc. It's very systemized, systematized. He said, and, and Hillman said, I'm not interested in the meta level I take the pearls, not the, not the, not the string. We're not making a necklace or a noose. Um, but then he, he goes on, he said, second level generation, second generation thinkers tend to abstract. They tend to systematize the original genius. Um, and he said, by contrast, what he, 
wants to be doing and what archetypal psychology is doing is more like art. It's more like poems than it is like a philosophical theory. Um, uh, he mentions in this respect, he talks about like that book by Peter Homans called Jung in Context it's from the University of Chicago. It's a, it's a good book, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a sociological book that he said there's a tendency there which happens in sociology to, redu to be reductive. So you'll take Jung and you'll say, well, Jung was Swiss, uh, his father was a pastor, etc., and that that explains Jung's theories. And Hillman says, this reduces the extraordinary to the ordinary. It loses the genius. Um, and uh, he, he didn't like that. He didn't like that about case histories. He didn't like he, he, he didn't want to lose the, the genius. Um, in talking about his own early uh, group of people in, 19, in the early 70s in Zurich, the early spring group, he called it a runt group within the larger Jungian community in Zurich. He says it, they had a separate place. It was passionate for about, uh, they spent about two years together, uh, very passionately engaged. And uh, um, he said there was this atmosphere of being seditious. Of, there was an excitement of being disruptive. And again, when he went to Dallas, he said it was, he described it as like six years of drinking and screaming um, uh, <laughs> with these great uh, fellow uh, archetypal psychologists, Sard Robert Sardello, Thomas Moore, Gail Thomas, Joanne Stroud, Louise Cowan. Um, and he says, in a group like that, he says, Eros is always present in the friendships, the loyalties, the collaboration. These are people who are in love with an idea. The imagination is set fire, and love comes from that. And, he's, and he contrasts that with, he said, Jung's tower, you know, the Bowling and Tower, is a great symbol for how he worked uh, in general. Jung worked alone. He had many pupils. Who, he had many followers with very powerful emotional attachments, but he didn't have a group. Um, he had, you know, Jacobi and von Franz, uh, uh, Lillian Fry, and so forth. They, but it, they were not in a collaborative eros um, the way uh, uh, the archetypal psychology community was. Um, the, he said Jung was alone in the medieval, uh, sorry, Jung was alone in the medical psychiatric um, world. And when he went to Eranos, Corban and Portman and Sholem and Eliada, they were all like Jung, they were outsiders in their professions. Then Hillman said, I work alone sometimes, particularly writing. But he said, I, he said I, I'm always walking around in a fog. That's a very Saturn Neptune image. You know, the, the fog is, is, you know, the moisture of, of Neptune, the Saturn is the, the obscurity. I'm always walking around in a fog, uh, uh, but then there's always a transmission. Um, that's the Mercury-Uranus comes through, the electric uh, idea, the, the lightning bolt. Um, but the forging does happen alone while writing. He adds, I don't know how open Jung was to receiving. This is a point that John Beebe has made, that, that Jung was so solar in certain ways that he, he wasn't so receptive um, to, because uh, he was so kind of radiating his own ideas um, that were coming through him. Um, Hillman summarizes, archetypal psychology is an organic result of Jung's work, but with a different emphasis. Um, he said, much Jungian psychology today is not actually in Jung's work. Um, object relations, uh, for example, all the, the focus on trauma, the focus on the transference, um, these are not as uh, uh, central to Jung's um, as they are in contemporary Jungian analysis. Jung's basic work, in Hillman's view, was alchemical, metaphorical, imagistic, um, dealing with psychic reality. He then makes an aside about Eranos was a community of renegades, of kindred spirits. 
He said these were unbelievable scholars. Sholem, Herbert Reed, Gerald Holton, Mircea Eliada, Henri Corbin. I had to go back to school and get another PhD. He said, these people encouraged each other indirectly. When you're uh, uh, there at Aranos and you're giving a lecture, which I, I, I've done several times in the, uh, in the last five, in the last decade, uh, it's a, a particular room there, and um, I've seen movies of when, uh, of when Jung was there, you know, 50 years earlier. And um, he said, when you're giving that talk, he says, in many ways, you're not talking just to the people who are there. He said, you're talking to the dead, to the tradition, and not so much to the audience. Um, he said, many of the people who were actually there at this time were, were very old. They had been in this part of Switzerland for a very long time. He said, there were no questions asked in the, uh, in the presentation of the paper. Then there, it, you'd go on for one hour, then there'd be a break, and then you'd do a second hour, like a sonata. Uh, then there'd be champagne outside in the, um, uh, out on the, on the deck. Uh, he said it was a most uncomfortable situation because you're sitting on benches like in Nuremberg um, for nine to 11 days long. That's how long the Aronos conferences were. But, he said, their largeness invites our own largeness. He said, he said, I saw the importance of resources. These men had piled up huge resources. Too many young people today, this is Hillman doing a Senex thing, too many young people today haven't read great novels, they haven't seen the great plays, they heard the great music, they lack resources. Um, he's emphasizing this idea of culture as something you cultivate you know, year after year through you know, reading the, the great works and listening to the great music. And by, he said, he, Hillman, he said, one feels small, uh, unable, stammering in the face of, of these large people, but an infusion happens, a participation mystique, just by being there. Then he says, the first generation of Jungians wrote Jungian psychology, uh, by contrast, the archetypal psychologists all are doing their own thing. In a sense, this is me speaking, Jung kind of like uh, founded the church. Uh, the structure had to be established, forged, strengthened, um, and then, then you have the potential for, for the, uh, the reformations, for the, pro the protesting, the pro Protestant, the, the, the Gnostic um, uh, heresies, the autonomy can flourish with archetypal psychology after the established structure has, has taken root. Um, he talked about his own battles with, uh, if on behalf of the environment in his hometown uh, in the later years in Thompson, Connecticut. He says, it was like for example, battling over the sewers there. He says it takes enormous amounts of time. It's so trivial, the various arguments, the huge lawyer costs, a small group of passionate people in love with the place, trying to protect it. And he said, um, he quoted Blake, the tree that brings tears of joy to one is only a green thing that stands in the way to another. Um, and he describes his own, um, the recent acquisitions in his own uh, intellectual journey, particularly the environment and ecology and the spirit of place, that that's very important and the Civil War, which he was particularly focused on in those later years, and then old age, an area of constant reflection. The book uh, is called The Force of Character, great book on old age. And he says, there's an enormous amount of discovery that goes on in late life that people in earlier life have no idea about, and that he himself is kind of glimpsing as, as he gets there. Um, he said, I write when, I, when my head is clearest, which is in the morning. It, but, he said, it's very difficult to take possession of the day. And then uh, an audience member said, uh, spirit in tribal healing rites feels different than how you, Hillman, write about it. This is a German woman who was speaking uh, from the audience. And then Hillman said, I'm not against the spirits, the daimons in these cultures, but I'm against spirit, 
Western spirituality, which is prejudiced against psyche. Now, this point is actually rather similar to uh, contemporary anthropologists and, and sociologists like, like Robert Bellow with his book, which really emphasized that, um, the, uh, that the, the tribal, the in indigenous perspective was one, the experience of the divine was very much one of spirits, of powerful beings, that, uh, not of a kind of transcendent monotheistic spirit. And um, so anyway, just there's something even kind of accurate anthropologically about Hillman's critique uh, there. All right, so I think, let's see, any questions or comments before I uh, end with a little, please. Um, you mentioned this earlier when you were looking at this chart, but it kind of connects with this issue of the plurality of spirits versus the one transcendent spirit. Um, but in terms of his um, Neptune-Saturn uh, square, in the Anima Mundi essay, he emphasizes that when he speaks of the Anima Mundi, he's not talking about something transcendent to things. Um, he's not talking about a unifying, all-pervading, panpsychic life force. He wants to point to the particularity and the, the eachness Yes. Things and that soul lives in the particular. Yes. Which seems to me a very Saturn. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's good. And that's why he celebrates like William James's right. focus on the eachness versus the Hegelian mm -hmm. uh, Geist. Yeah. Right. No, that's good. That is very. He's interested in seeing um, the soul in the particular concrete thing, um, the concrescence of it in a kind of uh, uh, Whiteheadian way. Um, that's good. Thanks for bringing that up. In fact, that reminds me of how he, he actually said, um, if I remember this correctly, he said, um, he was talking about, um, maybe it's in here. That he read every uh, in the in the 60s, he uh, he was just saying how the later Whitehead really affected him. Uh, he subscribed to Science, that was like the journal. Every week in the 60s, he read it. He said, "I couldn't get it. It's not my tree." Um, analytic philosophy, I couldn't get. I, it always felt like a defeat. Um, same with some poets, but then there were some poets that he was very. Uh, uh, he got a lot out of Yeats, uh, Wallace Stevens, um, but then he said the the later Whitehead affected me, and of course that that focus on on the eachness uh, is very strong in William James that he celebrated. See, Saturn is the em the embodied, concrete, manifest form, uh, not not this kind of uh, um, uh, transcendent uni unified uh, Geist. <coughs> Okay, uh, please. I've got an impression that I've gotten from like um, your exposition of how the environment. Good. I think that um, um, I, I think like again, I'm just like totally new to him, and so I don't want to also like consider him. But um, it seems like I, I guess I look for in a philosopher that there. Are, their ideas match up with their like methods um, in terms of like like Nietzsche has this, a way of um, taking those opposites, his contradictions that are inherent, and then using his style to sort of it, it, toss them around. Yeah, and it's very stylistic. But with him, his style seems like. It's this way, like an opinionated style. Yeah. Like it's very, um, like I have a strong opinion about this, but I, also it's the opposite too. And it's just like sort of deal with it. And like, I mean, actually, like I feel like that that could be like, it seems effective, but I'm just curious if maybe I'm missing something. No, I don't think you are. Um, I think he, uh, he thrives on that. Um, uh, uh, contradictoriness and ambiguity, and he's he he's constitutionally uh, allergic to 
having things work out in a consistent way that could be uh, coherent, like he, uh, and I think he actually is something like like Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche was because, as as Hollingdale, Nietzsche's biographer, says, Nietzsche would just be walking around. Um, he didn't have anybody that was reading him that he was, could listen to him, and so he had conversations with himself, and he'd take the opposite sides of the argument right in his own mind, and then he'd write it out. Uh, Hillman doesn't exactly do that. He's, he's more, he gets on a roll with a particular um, negation. Go ahead. Hillman's sense of self is really stable, as opposed to like Nietzsche, who seems like his sense of self, he really plays with it, and his um, presentation, and his ideas. But like with Hillman, it seems like I, his sense of self is like, this is this, you know, and it's very much um, stable. Well, I don't know. They're both real tricksters. I mean, and and Nietzsche can be just as uh, uh, rhetorically uh, like delivering the Zarathustra law. Um, very, you know, like in the Antichrist towards the end of his life, or even in, in Zarathustra, there's uh, ways in which he is um, uh, almost really biblical in his um, assertion and kind of getting. Uh, in, a, in a kind of archetypal possession state. I don't know, there's some, there's, but there's more of a God Almighty quality when you, Nietzsche, th that's a term that, that Hillman sometimes uses, is God Almightiness. He's not in, and Hillman d doesn't want to sound God, God Almighty, and he always wants to bring out the, a, a kind of uh, trickster deflating um, uh, comment to keep himself away from sounding too God Almighty. Um, let me um, end now with, uh, could, would, you, would you mind just um, uh, shutting the, the door there for the, for the, oh it is shut, okay, they're, they're really, uh, okay. Um, right at the um, the last really big lecture um, that kind of was of the quality uh, of the ones that went into revisioning psychology and that went into went to Aranos uh, was given to my knowledge was the one that he gave in 2000 to the big uh, archetypal, it was called Psychology at the Threshold. It was a big conference in Santa Barbara, at UC Santa Barbara, sponsored by Pacifica and so forth. And um, at this ex uh, conference, when he, he he got up and he, that's where he first said um, about the can't we snatch some <coughs> defeat from this victory. Uh, and then he, but then he went on to describe um, three universals that he felt were necessary to found a psychology after the catastrophe, which quote, that's Jung's term, after the catastrophe. What kind of a psychology do we need for the new millennium? And he said the three universals that psychology needs to found itself on are justice, beauty, and destiny. Justice, beauty and destiny. And here you see how Hillman really has embraced a, a, a Platonism, a Platonic. Uh, this, is, this is a new, it's a, it's, a note, it's, a, it's, a, it's a note that we've been hearing in the, in the distance, but suddenly he, he sounds it forth with great clarity in this talk, in this lecture. He said, without those three, we live in a Hobbesian world, uh, you know, uh, a, a world in which l life is, uh, you know, nasty, brutish, and short, uh, a war of all against all. Um, with these three universals, psychology finds itself in a moral, aesthetic, and intentional cosmos. With these, psychology finds itself in a moral, that's justice, aesthetic, that's beauty, and intentional, that's destiny, cosmos. 
he said, my empirical basis for saying this, because he, he's not claiming any kind of spiritual revelation, he's saying this as a kind of empiricist and um, uh, th healer, therapist. In, in the, my empirical basis of this is suffering, um, complaints, pathology. It was, it was suffering and complaint that sent Freud to find archetypes. Um, and he says, by the way, getting things right joins ethics to aesthetics. See that? Like how, like, obviously ethics is all about getting things right. But aesthetics is also about that. Like the artist wants to get it right, wants to get that sculpture, that, that painting, the, the, the sentence just right. Um, divine enhancement of the earthly world is the Neoplatonic principle of, of beauty, kalos. And then um, for him, uh, justice is, of course, what brings in, uh, the, that's, that's what motivates so much of his work in, in ecology, in, um, in social justice. I think that really emerges long after the revisioning psychology period. Um, and then with destiny, this is beautiful where he says, without destiny, psychology is anemic. Destiny gives us a mythical sense of life. Um, he says, destiny, destiny gives importance to the blows of tragedy. Beautiful. Destiny gives importance to the blows of tragedy. I think that's a, that's a profound recognition. Um, justice requires ethical passion. Beauty requires aesthetic and sensate passion. Destiny requires observance. Um, and uh, and these, these he posits as a value-based psychology for a new century. So I think I'll just leave us with this um, little uh, tribute that I um, happened to give. I, we were both lecturing at a, a talk in um, 1990, uh, at a conference in 1999, and I happened to be right after him. And um, and the name of his lecture just before me was How Do We Speak Psychology? And uh, so I, Hillman was just like sitting right here in, in this um, auditorium. And so I, just before I began my lecture, I just thanked him. So let me also thank James Hillman um, for his powerful, mas penetrating, masterly presentation. Um, James, from whom we have learned so much. Uh, Jim, we used to call him Jim. Uh, the, the later years, he went more by James. But anyway, I said, Jim, your work, in terms of how do we speak psychology, your work is itself a beautiful expression of how we can speak psychology. It is as if you have had a kind of lifelong love affair with psyche, with the soul. And your language is graced with a poetic richness and aesthetic splendor and care and a wit and a complexity. In all these respects, not unlike Shakespeare's language, which you wonderfully explored at that lecture at the Globe Theater in London a couple years ago. In a sense, your eros has given itself to psyche. And the fruit of this union is the beauty of your work, your ideas, your writing, your style, your poetics of language, winning over the culture, enticing and seducing it, provoking it to the beauty and love of the soul. For all this, we are deeply grateful. Okay, so that was, so he got to hear that, which I was happy about. Um, all right, so that's the end of our, um, of our time together. Your, your papers, uh, uh, you just read the description of, of what I'm uh, hoping to receive from you from the, in the uh, syllabus. It's very, obviously it's a one unit course. Um, have it be thoughtful, um, but uh, doesn't, it doesn't have to be long. Uh, and just have it be in a sense, you could just take a particular passage that, that um, inspires you to talk about it, share it, like something that moved you, and tell me why. Um, 
uh, some, j just do it in any way that you feel uh, excited by and I'll be excited by in reading it. Um, it's very, very simple. Um, okay, thanks a lot, guys. For, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, Thank you for letting me participate. Thank you very much.